Hello YouTube, it's CM Maritime History here back again for another video. And today I will be talking about CSS HL Hunt, which was known as the Iron Coffin of the Confederacy. And most information, if not all of it, in this uh, video is credited to Hunley.org. I highly recommend you go uh, visit them, which is actually where the real Hunley is. And it's a very informational website, so please go visit them. So, we're gonna, it's just gonna, this is definitely gonna be one of the, my longer videos. Um, just letting you know. It's going to be a very informational video, but it's also going to be quite long, because the Hunley has quite a detailed story. So we are going to start at the very beginning, the Hunley's design. Three men, McClintock, Watson, and Horace Lawson Hunley himself, which the sub would bear his name, did not linger over the loss of their sub, because, okay, so there were three subs built. The Pioneer, which sank in a lake and has to this day never really been found, if I remember correctly. The second, the American Diver, which has never been found. And the Hunley, which has been found and sits in the Warren Rash Conservation Center in South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina. So, they didn't linger over the loss of the Diver after the Diver went down fall camps. And with their funds exhausted in building the American Diver, they quickly found investors for their submarine, concept in the Organization of Confederate Engineers, who are referred to as the Singer Secret Service Corps. Now, the Singer Secret Service Corps was funded by, I forget his first name, but the same singer who, uh, I don't want to make a guess as to his first name, uh, so I don't provide any false information, but um, the same singer person is the very same person who would go on to found the singer sewing company. So, just that, just that little tidbit of information. They returned to their plans, confident in their ability to create a vessel that would succeed. Taking the lessons learned during the test missions of the Pioneer American Diver, War began a new submarine. Now, the Hunley looked quite similar to its sister vessel, the American Diver, but did have some upgrades. And the Hunley was built at Park and Lions Machine Shop in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, however, some refer to the Hunley as the fish boat or the fish torpedo boat based on its design. I don't really see how it looks like a fish, but um, I'm not going to question it. And, like I said earlier, it would be named for its benefactor, Horace Lawson Hunley, hence the HL. While the Hunley began her preliminary testing, uh, which would be right around uh, June of 1863, so... Uh, Gettysburg and Vicksburg had just happened at the same time. Times were increasingly desperate for the Confederacy, and the Hunley was initially designed to dive completely below her target while towing behind a floating torpedo on a 200-foot tether line. So to show you, let's go to the design here. This right here at the front would be where the, um, eventually it would be the spar, but at the moment it's just the tow line. So the spar would be here at the front. These are the dive planes, and this is the crankshaft that, that would have powered um, then we have the power here, which is turned by the eight-man crankshaft in here. And then the diving ports here and here. So this is actually a bottom view. And of course you have side view, and then a top view, which is kind of cut off when I put this in the fire port, which I apologize for. Now, the spar. You can actually see part of the spar here, just to show you some perspective. That would be the later, uh, thing for the hunt. But we're, just for this right now, we're just going to talk about the, uh, tow line. So the tow line would have been attached up on top of the submarine here. There would be a, it's not shown, maybe this is it right here, unless I'm wrong. The torpedo, which is what loosely called because it was more of a bomb, would be planted here, and then when it was ready to be um, attached and used on an enemy vessel, the person would come out of the forward conning tower or aft conning tower, depending on where it was, because I'm not really sure if this is the torpedo thing or not, and they would take it off of here, attach it to a tow line, and let it drag behind the sub. The sub would then go underneath the vessel, and then the, uh, just, if you see my mouse here, I'll show you, it would, the, uh, tether line torpedo would go up, and then it would get dragged towards the boat as the Hunley went forward, and then eventually detonate against the side of the hull. This did not actually succeed, and ended up, um, testing of this actually ended up causing the downfall of two of, of one of the Hunley's missions. So, let's keep going. And to safely dive under a Union vessel, the captain would need to carefully maneuver the 5-foot-tall submarine between the ocean bottom and the keel of the target ship. So, by the way, this doesn't really look like it's 5 feet tall. It is. These men 
there's a bench here, which you can see the bench. You can't sit down. Because they're they're all around six foot, okay? Also, sorry about the on battery thing if that actually shows up in the video. I don't know why my charger's doing that, but it is. Anyway. What I found and you know what, I'm just gonna take my charger out. That way it stops for that from the rest of the video. So anyway. These men had to crouch. They were pretty much squatting the entire time while turning this crank, and they had to turn this crank enormously fast to get this to, to make lots of rotations to move the honey. And the honey was very heavy, if I remember correctly from looking it up, around 19,000 pounds. Which, for a vessel, is not that heavy, but for something like this, quite. Now, I will post in the comments the correct uh, weight of the honey, but that's what I remember off the top of my head. I could be wrong, but I'll post it in the comments below. Anyway, so satisfied with the Hunley's performance, in July of 1863, a demonstration of the Hunley's attack capabilities took place for Confederate officials. An old coal hauling barge was anchored in the middle of the Mobile River. The Hunley approached her mark and then dove beneath the tar target vessel. When the torpedo hit the barge, it blew up and sank within minutes, and the Hunley resurfaced shortly after. After two years of attempts at the submarine concept, it had finally happened. The Hunley had successfully attacked her target. On site to witness the display were several high-ranking Confederate officials, including uh, Admiral Franklin Buchanan, who was Mobile's naval commandant, who then wrote a letter to one of the main players in the Hunley story, General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, or PGT Beauregard, if you look at the history textbook. In, in this letter, Buchanan said, I am fully satisfied the Hunley can be used successfully in blowing up one or more of the enemy's ironclads in your harbor. General Beauregard agreed, requesting the, must, the much needed fish boat be sent at once. So the Hunley was loaded on the two flat rail cars and sent to defend Charleston with the hope she could help destroy the blockade, strangling the city. So, to add some context to this, before we move on to the first two missions, the Hunley was designed to be a blockade runner. So, what she would do, well, not a blockade runner, but I should say a blockade destroyer so the blockade runners could get through. Sorry for the misclarification. The Hunley, now, this is for the in, the whole um, torpedo spar up front here, where the front at the bottom of the hull would have a spar going out like this, and then a relatively flat piece would run out from the hull just like this. And then the torpedo would be down here at the bottom. So, the first crew of the Hunley that went on the first mission were Michael Kane, Nicholas Davis, Frank Doyle, Charles Hasker, John Kelly, Lieutenant John A. Payne, Absalom Williams, and William Robinson. So, let's add some context. The H.L. Hunley arrived in Charleston on August 12, 1863, accompanied by James McClintock and Gus Whitney. They were both investors in the sub, and you've heard me mention McClintock's name before in the video at the very beginning. The crew quickly began, began, oh, sorry, can't speak today. The crew quickly began testing the Hunley in Charleston Harbor. Frustrated by McClintock's pace, the Confederates seized the Hunley submarine and turned it over to Lieutenant John Payne, a Navy man assigned to the CSS Chicora. Now, if you want naval designation, CSS is the same as USS. It's Confederate State Ship, whereas USS is United States Ship. It's relatively similar in terms of naming. And that's just the naval context for you. And on August the 29th of 1863, the Hunley was moored at Fort Johnson, preparing to depart for its first attack on the blockade when it suddenly sank at its dock. There are conflicting stories of what happened here. Some claim the wake of a passing ship flooded in the Hunley's open hatches, filling up enough water to sink it. Others claim the mooring lines of another ship became tangled on the submarine, pulling it onto its side until its hatches were underwater. Whatever happened, the result was the same. The Hunley sank immediately, taking five of her crew down to her death. Deaths. Deaths with the submarine. Now, Charles Hasker, Lieutenant John A. Payne, and William Robinson all survived the submarine because they were the closest to the hatches and were actually able to get out before the submarine rolled over and sank. Uh, what else happened? Okay, so, Payne, who was standing actually on top of the sub, I'm sorry, I forgot about this part, he jumped into the water and was rescued, and William Robinson escaped through the after hatch, being the one back here, and Charles Hasker, trapped by the hatch cover itself, up here, rode the sub to the bottom before freeing himself and swimming to the surface, because the only way the sub pressure would equalize enough to let the hatches open is at the very bottom. Because it was more shallow here than it was in other places. 
So it took some weeks to retrieve the submarine because, as if you've ever looked at uh, technology back then, you know it's not that advanced. Just look at uh, Battlefield Surgeon. Trust me, you're going to find some not advanced stuff, like bone saws, for example, not to be gruesome, but still. And in that time, they took to retrieve the submarine. Horace Helmy arrived in Charleston and demanded the submarine be returned to him. General Beauregard granted a request, and Helmy sent for a crew of men from the Park and Lines machine shop in Mobile, Alabama, where the submarine was designed. So, the Hunley, as we've learned, so far has killed quite a few people, and by the way, this whole first mission with the rolling over of the submarine or just sinking at its moorings, whichever three you believe, happened in seconds. It was very quick, very fast, and no one really knew what was happening. And most of the people who were killed in the submarine, the first mission, were in here. They couldn't really get out because they were trapped by the other people at the hatches, so it was it's very tragic. Now, when the Hunley was raised, if you ever watch the movie The Hunley, which I will talk about later in this video, the bodies were still in there. We're not talking about skeletons, we're talking about human flesh and bone. And they were bloated. Not to be gruesome, so if you're a younger person watching, I would... Cover your ears or shut off the video at this part. They had to cut the bodies into pieces to fit them out through the hatches. My personal opinion, why would you keep using this death trap if you have to cut someone's body to fit them through a hatch? Not even take the paneling off, just cut someone's body out so you can take them out through this. To me, I don't understand. But let's keep going. The second crew. All hands lost. Everyone died. There was no saving anyone. And if you ever watch the Hunley movie, this takes place at the very beginning. So, the second group consisted of Charles L. Sprague, John Marshall, Henry Baird, Charles McHugh, Thomas W. Park, Joseph Patterson, Robert Brockbank, and Horace Hunley, the captain. You know, the main financier we talked about up here. So, back to the second mission. October the, on October the 15th, Horace Hunley scheduled a demonstration of his boat in Charleston Harbor. He announced his vessel would dive beneath the CSS Indian Chief, which is mentioned in the movie as well, and service on the other side. Once the submarine disappeared beneath the waves, it was not seen again for weeks. So the submarine dive, dove underneath the Indian Chief and didn't come back up. Battle weather delayed search efforts and divers did not recover the HL Hunley until November the 7th. It was found deep in the harbor channel, with its bow buried in the mud. So the Hunley is sitting on a 45 degree angle, its bow is buried in the mud, and its stern is hanging in the air. Chains and ropes were used to hoist it to the surface and place it on the dock, so it basically would have been in this scenario, right here. And you can actually see they're uh, cleaning the submarine here, so this I'm guessing just because of the rust on it would have been after the uh, first, first or second mission. Just a guess here. When its hatches were opened, there was a gruesome sight with the crew members seemingly frozen in time with the second mission. Now, the first mission I told you about, the bodies were bloated and had to cut them out. But with this, it was even worse. Thomas Park was found of his head in the aft conning tower, trying to get out, frozen in a face of terror. Horace Hunley was still clutching at the candle, so to explain the candle, the captain... Whoever was in charge of the Hunley had a candle, and when that candle went out, they knew the oxygen was running out, so they would try to get the sub back up. That is why there were candles. And rescuers reported the forward ballast tank valve had been left open, allowing the submarine to fill with water. So, to show you, the forward compartment of the Hunley ends about here, and the aft compartment ends right behind the aft conning tower here. The rest of this is ballast tanks. However, the inside of the Hunley, there is a gap. Pretty much a wall, like a half wall. You can look over into the ballast tank. We couldn't even look over, it was a little, it was a little uh, tight, but if there was more room, you could. And the water, Horace Hunley forgot to close the forward sea cock, or sea valve, whichever you prefer to use in terminology. So it kept flooding and flooding, and, event and back here at the end, I forget his, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, and I apologize for that, he kept trying to pump it out and pump it out. 
but it was no use, and Horace Hung exhausted all his energy before he realized that the seacock was open and that he, had, he could not do anything about it. So anyway, the wrench used to operate the seacock was found on the floor of the submarine, leading them to theorize that Hunley either forgot to close the valve or lost the wrench and was unable to close it. The sub's keel weights had been partially loosened, which suggested the crew realized they were in danger, but not in time to save themselves. So, that's the first two missions of Hunley, and those two missions gave it the name Iron Coffin, and led General Beauregard to say that that submarine was more of a danger than the Union Army to Confederate forces in Charleston, which is a pretty bold statement, if I say so myself. So the third Hunley crew, who were all volunteers, and this is the most famous one, and if you ever watched the Hunley movie, this is what it most focuses on. Joseph Ridgway, James A. W Wicks, C. Lumpkin, now if you do go to the Hunley Museum, it does something about a C. Simpkin, Instead of C. Lumpkin, so I, I don't know what the name is exactly. Frank Collins, who play who was played by Sebastian Roche in the movie. Corporal J. F. Carlson, Arnold Becker, and Lieutenant George E. Dixon, who's played by Armand Asante in the movie. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, this is arguably the most famous crew of the Hunley, especially for what they did. Which you can see, this is the painting of the Hunley attacking the Houstonic in the dead of night. On February the 14th, if I remember correctly, 1863, off the top of my head. I'm reading off the script here, but I didn't scroll down that far yet. So anyway, also, I forgot to say, Crewman Miller. He does not have a first name, or maybe that is his first name. Or maybe he doesn't have a last name. He's just known as Miller. In the Hunley Museum, he's listed as Crewman Miller, but I don't, I don't really know what his name is. So anyway, let's continue. Two tragedies have now befallen the Hunley. The sinking's invisible recovery efforts that followed had created quite a stir in Charleston. It was not long before Rear Admiral John Dahlgren, the head of the Union blockading fleet, who was the creator of the Dahlgren cannon gun, learned of the diving submarine from, from Confederate deserters. In response, Dahlgren ordered his blockading squadron to anchor in shallow water, hang ropes and chains over the sides as defensive, of, as defensive measures, and deploy picket craft to keep torpedo bearing boats away. These clever, these clever tactics were also the genesis of anti submarine counter, countermeasures. Now, if you look at this picture, ah, sorry, the Houston does not have any of these deployed. Reason being that she was told to move at a moment's notice, so they would have had to haul everything back in, so therefore they couldn't put anything out. So they were pretty much a sitting duck with Hunley. Let's continue. Confederate General Beauregard was reluctant to put Hunley back in service, writing, this is the exact quote that I kind of paraphrased earlier, it is more dangerous to those who use it than to the enemy. Still, the submarine had persuasive backers, including Lieutenants George Dixon and William Alexander, played by, I believe his name is Alex, Alex Jennings, I believe is his name. I think I got, maybe, I hope I got that right, but I think that's correct. I hope it is. Anyway, he plays, um, Lieutenant William Alexander, who would have been, not the night the Hunley sank, but before that, he was, uh, ordered back to Mobile. But before the sinking, that happened, and he was actually, was supposed to be the person who would have sat back here with the aft ballast pump. And even they knew the Hunley had to be modified if she were to be successful. Hunley's anti sub no, sorry, the Union's anti-submarine moves coupled with the difficulty of controlling the Hunley's depth and pitch, while submerged led them to completely rethink their mode of attack. Towing an explosive device was abandoned for a more direct approach. Now, in the movie, this is based off of what Beauregard says, but I personally don't believe this is true. A spar for torpedo attack, no one really knows who designed it. It's been speculated it's the Singer Submarine Corps, but no one really knows for sure. Uh, with a torpedo attached to its tip was mounted to the lower bow of the submarine. Now, if you actually go to the Hunting Museum and buy one of the resin models, you will actually see the spar on it. I actually have it sitting next to my desk here. If I had my camera active, I could actually show you, but I do not have it active at this point in time. Sorry for that. In this design, the plan was to ram the spar into the hull of an enemy ship, detonating the torpedo, either on contact or by a trigger-pulled device. It was perhaps sufficient, but with a 16-point spar, it left the crew dangerously close to the explosion. There was a little time, if any, to test the new attack strategy, and even though General Beauregard was reluctant, he finally agreed to let the Hunley try again, but only if the submarine did not dive and operate at the surface. With the dangers of the submarine well known, a new courageous volunteer crew was selected and put under the command of Lieutenant George E. Dixon. 
Soon the vessel would be ready to carry out its final mission. Captain George Dixon and his volunteer crew worked aboard the Humley an average of four nights a week between mid-December of 1863 and the end of January 1864, when the weather became too rough to venture in the ocean. On many of these trips, the submarines were close enough to blockade ships to hear Union soldiers singing, which you can't hear in the movie, but they never got the chance to attack. Dixon wrote to a friend expressing frustration with the conditions that stopped them from making an attack on the blockade. To catch the Atlantic Ocean smooth during the winter months is, is considerable of an undertaking and one that I never wish to undertake again. On a moonlit night in February 1864, the crew of the Humney was given the calm sea they waited for and embarked on their ambitious attack. The target was the USS Housatonic, one of the Union's mightiest, mightiest and newest sloops of war. The Humney's approach was stealth, and by the time they were spotted, it was too late. At about 8.45 p.m. that night, several sailors, which you can see they're already here, on the deck of the USS Housatonic reported seeing something on the water just a few hundred feet away. The officer on the deck thought it might be a porpoise coming up to, coming up to, um, you know, I don't know what the exact terminology is, but, um, you know how whales have, like, a blowhole and then it comes up top. I don't know what the exact terminology is for porpoise, but same like that. As the object approached the ship, the crew realized there was no porpoise. The alarm sounded and the sailors fired their guns, the bullets pinging off the metal hull of the Humvee. Below the surface, the spar torpedo detonated and the explosion blew a hole in the ship. The Houston Tonic sank in less than five minutes, causing the death of five of its 155 crewmen. And by the way, if you guys would like me to do a video on the Houston Tonic by itself, I can do that. Just let me know down in the comments below. Nearly 45 minutes later, a Union soldier claimed he saw a blue light on the water. Some speculate this was the last reported sighting of the Humvee for more than a century. One record indicates Dixon had promised troops about a marshal. If successful, he would signal the shore by showing two blue lights. The Confederates on Sullivan's Island say they saw the agreed-upon signal and lit a fire to guide the Humvee home, but she never returned. Instead, the submarine and crew disappeared in the darkness of the sea. Their fate became a mystery and their accomplishment a legend. The submarine would not see the light of day again for over 136 years. So, do you guys believe the theory that the Humvee was able to show, uh, you no, know, shine its blue light, blue calcium lamp, um, at the very end there before it went down? If you guys think so, uh, let me know down in the comments below. And in the movie, they actually do, but I personally don't believe they did. There just wasn't enough time. So, museum ship life. Eventually, the Hunley was recovered. And she was brought up and put in the Warren Lash Conservation Center. Now, this is the Hunley as she sits today. You can see the crankshaft. All the bodies are removed. It was completely excavated on the inside, and all the sand and silt were taken out of it. Now, yes, these plates were removed just so the person, people could get inside the Hunley to excavate. And this is the hatch, the after hatch cover by the looks of it, just from the direction. And you can see it's uh, kind of bolted into the Hunley here, just uh, from the wall to the Hunley, just keep it upright. Because when they found the Hunley, it was actually sitting on a 45 degree angle. So it actually stayed that way for quite some time until it was fixed and brought up. So it still sits there to this day. I have had the honor of visiting the Hunley. It's a very moving experience. And I would definitely stop by for one of their hour-long lectures. It's it, it can be long and some sometimes tedious, but I, I found it very interesting the one I sat through. It was about the individual mechanisms of the Hunley. For example, I did that this right here is called a dead light. That they were actually glass panes that would have let light into the Hunley if it was on the surface. As well as there were actually panes in conning towers as well, but uh, these were, of course, where the, where the crew members would sit. And then over here further, there's something known as a snorkel box. Actually, uh, you can see it right here. Now, it never worked. Not properly. But if it had worked, if Hunley was close to the surface, they could actually bring this up and it supposedly would have brought air in. But it was never really tested properly, so nobody ever really found out. So, you've heard me talking about the Hunley movie all throughout the video. I purchased a copy of it um, down at the Hunley Museum, and I found it very... I wanted to get it for a long time, but I just had it, the opportunity to buy it down at the Hunley Museum. And I found it very educational, very interesting. Uh, Lieutenant Dixon, and this is Bobert Gloria, the care played by Donald Sutherland. And I actually do have a... Uh, I did actually get to sit in the Hunley movie prop. They have that there, too, where they uh, film scenes inside the Hunley of the crew, which I found to be very interesting. It's very dark and very cramped, until I realized that I actually have it on the outside. It said it was 
something something along the lines of like 10% bigger than the actual Hunley, like the size wise, and it was just crazy. Like it's astounding to me. So anyway, guys, if you have any, uh, this video is already quite long, but I thought I would instead of splitting it up into parts, is the last time I did that, you guys didn't seem to uh, like that that much. Instead of just doing the one individual video, that's longer. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. And like I said, of the questions I asked, if you'd like to answer those down in the comments below, you can go ahead. Uh, please, I just got the YouTube community tab, so check out my messages. I post there almost daily now, so go check that out. And like and subscribe, please. And if we get more people, you know, of course, there'll be more videos. And like I said in the community tab, if you haven't seen that already, uh, there will be a video on the Queen Mary. The U.S. Clam Gore will also get a video, and there will also be a new Slowbrook series out pretty relatively soon in the upcoming weeks or days. I'm not really sure when they'll all be out yet, but they will be out soon. Anyway, guys, have a good one. Bye.